Shakespeare and fairies. Well, the Elizabethans and fairies. Magic, fairies, witches, folk remedies, all of these things were a part of everyday life in this era. It was a time filled with superstition and occult belief, a fear of the other world, a respect for it also. The other world was always there, hovering in the background, especially in rural countryside places like Stratford-upon-Avon, where Shakespeare was born and raised. Shakespeare was a country boy at heart. So, it isn't surprising really that fairies and magic appeared in a lot of his plays, despite the fact that the church condemned all such creatures as sent by the devil. The fairy folk in his day were the pesky beings who played tricks on people that could cause disease, sickness, bad luck. Meddlesome and sometimes dangerous, kidnappers and thieves. Puck is typical of this character, eager to cause trouble and mischief as soon as his king encourages him. Midsummer's Night itself, this time of the year where the veil between the worlds is thin, an old festival time, a time of powerful magic, especially love magic. So, mixed up with the mischief of fairies such as Puck, the petty quarrel between Oberon and Titania, the time of the year of love magic, and a changeling child, no wonder so much chaos ensued with the tricking of the four human lovers for sport by Puck and the tricking of Titania and the pompous bottom by King Oberon. Shakespeare certainly knew the character of fairies and also the power of midsummer magic and also folk medicine. Midsummer Night's Dream is full of folk medicine plants and flowers and fauna. Peas blossom, mustard seed, cobweb and moth were all used in folk medicine. All had spells, all with interesting folklore and social history. And also the loving idleness flower used to enchant Titania, given to Puck by Oberon. And then there is the changeling boy, the root cause of all the problems. Changelings, as we know, are fairy creatures themselves. This stolen child was quarrelled over by the king and queen. And finally, there is the chanted spell that Titania's handmaidens and fairy court sing to lull her to sleep, an incantation of protection. There is so much magic and fairy in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and here I will tell but a little. So let us step into the enchanted forest, dear friends, for a while, and let's just see who we might meet there. Oberon. There are many epic kings in mythology. Some became fairy or magical in folklore warriors and rulers in the histories, ballads and epic tales. Oberon, though, doesn't seem to have any basis in folklore as Oberon, but Shakespeare drew an atmosphere of many of the great mythical kings, Arthur, Finvara, Midir and so many others. The name Oberon itself seems to have been adopted from a 13th century medieval French romantic ballad by Huon de Bordeaux. In this tale, Oberon, spelled with an A, U, is a magical fairy king who appears to the son of the Count of Bordeaux and helps him. In the ballad, Oberon is said to own a magical cup that never empties when held by those of a good heart. The French name Oberon, spelt this way, is an affectionate term for the name Aubert, 
And this name itself comes from the Germanic name Alberic, or in Anglo-Saxon, Alfric, which means ruler of the elves. So, although Oberon as a character has no basis in folklore history, he does have a fitting name, and Shakespeare had a wealth of inspiration to develop the character of the fairy king. Titania As with Oberon, her husband, Titania as an actual named fairy queen has no base in folklore, although there are of course many, many fairy queens in mythology. Her name seems to have the root born of the Titans. These were the gods and the goddesses that came before the gods of Olympus. And so Shakespeare gave Titania a very ancient lineage indeed. And also associated with ancient Greece, which is fitting as the play is set in ancient Greece itself, in Athens. Shakespeare fused a peculiar mix-up of the ancient Greek and British mythologies. Ovid, the Roman writer, in his The Metamorphoses, calls the goddess Diana Titania. And on looking at Shakespeare's work and other playwrights and poets of this era, it becomes obvious that Ovid had a great influence on many, many great works. The goddess Diana was the Romanized Greek goddess Artemis. She was the goddess of nature, springs and wells and streams. She was also known as Limne, the lady of the lake. How very fitting then that this goddess, who was written as a fairy queen, has association with the fairy lady of the lake, Morgan le Fay and Nimue, and therefore must be a very powerful fairy woman indeed. Puck, Robin Goodfellow. A whole episode could be created about Puck, Robin Goodfellow and his type. They are associated with pixies, house brownies, hobgoblins and such, and to be honest I probably will at some point as he and his kind are fascinating fellows indeed. The root of the name Puck is said to be the old English word Pukka, and as English is one of the Germanic languages, we can find similar words in the other Germanic languages too. For example, in Old Norse there is Pukki, in Swedish Pukka, Icelandic Pukki and in Frisian Puk, all seemingly following the Viking trading paths. However, also following the Celtic tribal paths, we have the Welsh Puka, the Cornish Bucca, the Irish Puka, and the Devonshire Pixie. It is not certain where the original root word would have come from or what it would have been or meant, but it was obviously representing something very powerful and very old. There seems to be much scholarly debate back and forth about this, but really how can we ever know? We are talking of the ghosts of oral traditions and stories. The other name of the mischievous Puck, the other name he goes by in the play, is Robin Goodfellow, and isn't that the most enigmatic name? As this aspect of a fairy, he was known as a drudging fiend, a shapeshifter, meddlesome, dual-natured, a prankster, causing trouble for his own amusement as he does in the play A Midsummer Night's Dream, by taking it upon himself to mix up the four human lovers. He causes trouble for trouble's own sake. However, although Robin Goodfellow could be a downright nuisance, he was also known to be a domestic fairy, 
and could perform kind nighttime tasks for the household to which he is attached. The family could find the needlework done, the butter churned, the rooms cleaned. These little tasks would have to be paid for, of course. After all, that is only fair. And the ladies of the house were expected to leave out white bread. White bread, a luxury indeed in times when brown bread was the common bread of the people. And also they would leave out a bowl of milk or cream in payment. To neglect this was asking for trouble. The good works of Puck would be undone, and Robin, Puck, would also steal anything that he thought he might be owed from the household. These creatures, these Pucks, Pixies, Buckers and so on, they are solitary figures, roaming here and there, everywhere and nowhere, causing trouble and mischief. So. If you trip on the road and there is nothing there, or things go missing in your house that you have just put down, well, that might just be the meddlesome Robin Goodfellow. Titania has four fairy handmaidens. These are cobweb, mustard seed, peas blossom and moth. Here we will look at some of the folklore surrounding these four fairy names. Cobweb In Old English, the spider was known as a cop, hence copperweb, which later became cobweb. It is only cobweb spiders that produce cobwebs, Theridiidae and Linifidae, but in Shakespeare's day, being a country boy, he would probably just have known spiders as spiders and cobs. In general, spiders were regarded as beneficial to the household and also with kindness. They would very rarely be killed. The webs created by the spiders could be used to staunch wounds and stop bleeding. One folk remedy states that to cure a child of the thrush, the spider should be caught, put in the tube of a goose quill, sealed in and hung around the child's neck. Heaven knows how you attempt to put a spider in the tube of a goose quill. Irish tradition warns, never kill a spider, and it was said in Scotland that little spiders making fluffy nests on stalks of corn that were still standing in the field were weather predictors. The height of the nest on the stalk being the height the snow would fall that winter. Throughout time, and in so many cultures around the world, the spider has symbolized patience and persistence a weaver of webs to hunt with, patiently creating these delicate deadly traps and waiting and waiting, and of course when they break, starting again. Because of the spinning of webs, the spider is the symbol of spinning, basket weaving, cloth making, knot work, and the crafting of nets. These were traditionally the jobs of the women in the community and family, and so it is not really very surprising that spiders and their incredible talents were associated with the goddesses who spin the fates, and the stories of the lives of we human men and women. The folklorist John Rees, writing about the comparisons of the languages of Welsh and Breton, says fairies, like spiders, are also spinners, and that spider gossamer could sometimes be from the weaving and the looms of the fairies. In Greek mythology, and let us remember that Greek mythological influence on Shakespeare's work at this time was very important, the maiden Arachne, from where we get the name Arachnid, claimed that she was the best weaver, even better than the goddess Athena. 
Furious at this insult from a mere human, the goddess Athena challenged Arachne to a weaving contest. Arachne won, much to the fury of the goddess. Athena did not take the loss lightly. She transformed Arachne into a spider. However, Arachne and her daughters became known as the best weavers that have ever existed, so it was a pretty hollow final victory for Athena. In so many cultures the fates are the spinners of the threads that create the tapestries of human lives, the spiders. This was not lost on the great playwright at all. Mustard Seed Mustard. This is an interesting topic. We have mustard as we have come to know it, ground from seeds, and also the garlic mustard plant and flower that grows so profusely in the hedgerow. And so I will tell a little of the folklore of both here. As both were folk medicines, both have interesting folklore, so to talk of one and not the other would be unfair. First we will talk about mustard and her seeds. In medieval Europe, mustard was used in cooking exactly as it is now, to enhance a bland diet. The poor had a very bland diet. And also, the seeds were chewed by poorer folk to disguise the taste and scent of food that had gone bad. Nothing could be wasted in this time, and so it was done instead of throwing the food away. As a folk medicine, mustard has always been used in poultices and remedies. It was chewed on to help soothe the pain of toothache. A poultice of mustard was smeared on cloth and bound on the chest to help clear fluid and congestion from the lungs. However, I have to say I'm not sure about the belief that mustard could cure the sting of a scorpion. Folklore tells us that evil spirits can be kept out of the house by sprinkling mustard seeds around the outside. Peculiarly, this tradition is the same as far apart as India and Denmark. In Germany there is a tradition that says that if a bride wants dominance of her own future household, she should sow mustard seeds into the hem of her wedding dress. Now we will talk of garlic mustard, that was also known as poor man's mustard, and the fabulous name, Jack by the Hedge. This latter name has two explanations. The first is that Jack was originally Jake's, as in the toilet. The name giving a hint of what some would consider the awful smell of garlic that it exudes. Although, I think most people quite like this smell. The other idea is that Jack refers to one of the names of the devil in Old English. It was said that the devil's breath smelled of garlic. Whatever the reason might be, this plant has a huge amount of uses for cooking and adding vitamins to the food, much needed in poorer diets also a folk medicine, and it being readily available growing in the hedgerows, even the poorest of the poor could find some help from Jack by the Hedge. In folk remedies, it was used as an antiseptic on leg ulcers, bruises, cuts and sores. It was used to treat sore throats, coughs and colds, to clear a stuffy head. It encouraged the sweating out of fevers, and was even used for colic and kidney stones. In the southwest of England, in Somerset, freshly picked leaves were rubbed on sore, tired feet that had developed cramp. In Kent, in the southeast of England, it was a particular favourite herb for sore throats and the treatment of wounds. In Norfolk, 
again in the east of England, it was chewed for mouth ulcers and sore gums. All of these illnesses speak of poverty, of hard living and a lack of nutrition. It's a good job that these pretty plants were so available to the community poor. Peas Blossom The Blossom of the Pea The Pea Flower Peas were an integral staple food throughout history, a small, easily dried and stored food that could last for months. It was cheap to buy and they are easy to grow. The dried peas would be soaked to rehydrate them and used then in stews and soups. These bulked out a very meager diet. Peas were an important part of life and the flower surely one of the prettiest to be found. The pea would have been very familiar to Shakespeare as a food and also for its use in the folk remedies of the time. And the flower truly is an inspirational little fairy beauty. The petals are so very fairy-like. There is a rhyme from the Middle Ages that is still very familiar today. A rhyme about pea stew and soup and how it can last and last and still be filling a nutritious part of a meal. Peas porridge hot, peas porridge cold, peas porridge in the pot nine days old. To think that children would have sung this little ditty in the medieval era and still sing this now so many hundreds of years later. Surely Shakespeare must have heard it and maybe sung it too. There is a peculiar piece of sympathetic folk magic that the pea is instrumental to, the healing of warts. This European remedy for wart removal told that for each wart a pea should be chosen and placed in a switch of paper. This was then buried with the spell recited, as this pea shall rot away, so my wart shall so decay. In Norse mythology, the god Thor punished the human world by giving us peas. The angry and quick-tempered Thor tasked his dragons with carrying peas into the human world. These the dragons were supposed to drop into all the water wells. The wells would then be fit for nothing and the water spoiled and rank to drink. It must have been a very difficult task for the dragons to fly and carry so many peas. Some of the peas fell to the earth where they took root. The human races, therefore, had a new vegetable, and at that a very useful one to add to their foods. Thor was said to be livid, as you can imagine. To placate him, the humans dedicated the pea to Thor and agreed only to eat peas on a Thursday, on Thor's day. In Finland and Sweden, it is still traditional to eat pea soup on a Thursday. And what of the beautiful sweet pea? This came much later than Shakespeare's day to England and the rest of the North. Well. There is some Irish folklore around this beautifully scented flower that is too pretty to leave out. It is said that if you plant your sweet peas before sunrise, between the dates of the 1st of March and March the 20th, and most especially on St. Patrick's Day, your sweet peas will be all the more sweeter and larger. Their scent will be stronger and more perfumed than all others. In the Elizabethan era, both peas blossom and mustard were used in folk magic to provoke love and lust, very fitting for a Midsummer Night's Dream. Moth The folklore of the British Isles has quite a negative view of moths, nocturnal creatures, 
Their time is the dark when we humans are at our most vulnerable. In the middle of the 1800s, the folklorist Robert Hunt collected a belief from a Mr. Toms that some of the people of Cornwall believed moths held the souls of those who had passed away. I know many people now who still have this belief. Other moths were known to be fairies. These were known in Cornwall as pisgies, or as we now call them pixies. The same Mr. Toms also told of the belief in the Truro area of Cornwall in the southwest of England that moths gathering together in a flight heralded a death. Indeed, in this county it was the souls of unbaptized infants that became pisgies, and therefore also moths. This association with death was also echoed in Yorkshire in the north of England where one species of moth was known locally as the soul, and in the Lake District, also in the north, moths were seen as a portent of a passing away. The Cornish seemed to have had a thing about moths. Mothers would warn children that the pisky moth would play tricks on them while they slept. This is not a very nice thing to tell a small child who you would really want to have sweet dreams. The minuscule fairy Queen Mab was known to be a midwife of dreams too, also a Shakespearean fairy character. He must have known of this a folkloric association of fairies and moths and dreams. Most probably he did. Fairies, witches, magic and spells were all a part of Elizabethan life. Another Cornish folk belief is that at St Nun's Well, near Loo, a very pretty place, you had better leave a bent pin as an offering, or you will be followed home by drifts of pisgies in their disguise as moths. In the country of Scotland, moths were called witches and were believed to be uncanny creatures that brought with them a sense of dread. In northern England, white moths were said to be the souls of deceased children or heralded the loss in a family. A brown moth entering the house meant an important letter was on its way. Was moth really a moth? There is a current train of thought that moth was actually a moat, as in a dust moat. In the time of Shakespeare, moth was also pronounced and written moat. Indeed, the playwright did just this himself. Shakespeare says many times that fairies are incredibly small, and moth, or moat, was so small that Bottom, when speaking to Titania's handmaidens, only addresses peas blossom, cobweb, and mustard seed. It is as though poor Moth is so tiny she is almost invisible. So was she really a moat, a dust moat? It is an interesting concept to discuss. Love in Idleness The flower that Oberon gives to Puck to cause much mischief and to try and beguile his lover and wife Titania back to himself is a pretty and powerful little flower. This magical plant that Oberon uses the droplets of to enchant Titania, causing her to fall hopelessly in love with the pompous mechanical amateur actor Bottom, the first person who she sees on waking. In the hands of the very tricksy Puck, it was also used in the love magic and mischief he causes to confuse and almost bring to fighting the human lovers, Hermia and Helena, 
Demetrius and Lysander. And what is this very powerful little flower, this love in idleness? Well, it is the sweet, common and ever so pretty wild pansy, Viola tricolor. This little flower has some fabulous folk names, Heartsies, Johnny Jump Up, Heart's Delight, Tickle My Fancy, Jack Jump Up and Kiss Me, Come and Cuddle Me, Three Faces in a Hood, Pink of My John. There is an echo in many of these names alluding to love magic and love making magic isn't there? And we come to some Greco-Roman mythology again, the thing that seems to infuse so many of Shakespeare's plays, and there are two stories I will tell you here. The wild pansy, it is said, was originally white, a white flower. Cupid, the god of love, desire and affection, shot one of his arrows at a woman of the imperial court. It missed, and it landed instead in the center of a very, very small flower. It landed and it bruised the flower, which turned purple and yellow, and it also received the full dose of Cupid's love potion. From that very day, the pansy, love in idleness, heart seized was the source of love potions and magic. When dripped into the eyes of a person, it was believed that they would fall hopelessly in love with the next person that they saw. In Titania's case, rather than the effect Oberon wanted, which was for her to see him and their quarrel end, her to submit to him, and hand over the changeling child. It was Bottom who wandered into her bower where she lay sleeping. The other Greek love story tells that Zeus, always falling in love and seducing women, fell for a maiden called Io. Once again, and understandably so, his wife Hera became insanely jealous. Zeus, rather than leaving Isle alone, transformed the poor maiden into a young cow that he kept constantly grazing by his feet. In pity he caused all the ground where the cow ate to grow these beautifully pretty small flowers. I'm quite sure though that Io would much have preferred remaining or returning to being a woman. The gods and goddesses were not always the nicest of creatures. As a folk remedy, the heart seas was used in medicines and also as a perfume. The Celts and the Romans were known to have created perfume from this beautiful small flower. There is a fascinating folk tale from Germany where it is known as the little stepmother. In this tale, the large bottom petal sits on two sepals, and this is the stepmother. The two petals next to this are her daughters, and these both have a sepal each to sit upon. The top two petals are her stepdaughters, and these share a single sepal and are always at the back of all the other petals in the queue. Other folk tales say that by placing some of the flowers under your pillow, you will attract a new lover. And a sympathetic magic spell is to plant the pansies in a heart shape. If they grow well, if they flourish and flower, so will the love you have. Another tale tells that picking the flowers on a sunny day will bring about storms, and worse still, picking the flowers in the dew will attract to death. What is interesting also is that heartsease, 
The wild pansy was Queen Elizabeth I's favourite flower, and they are scattered through the fabrics that made up her clothes. She also loved to embroider them on gifts made for her family, and they appear in many paintings of her. Shakespeare was writing plays aimed at pleasing the Queen, a flatterer also. It would be obvious to conclude he added the wild pansy to the script, knowing full well it would please Elizabeth. The Changeling Boy Really, the subject of changelings needs a complete episode of its own, but I could not write a piece about this play without including the poor stolen child, as it is he that is the cause of all the problems and the root of the plot. The argument between Oberon and Titania is because she will not give him this child to grow up in his court, but wants to keep him for herself. It is a shame they didn't just think of giving him back to his parents, but then fairies, fickle as the wind, and who of those two would think what a human child would need? I will only talk of some changeling folklore here, but for those who may not know, a changeling is a fairy, sometimes a very elderly one, that is left in place of a human child that is stolen by the fairies. The babies are carried off to their world. So, really the child in the play isn't the changeling at all, but is really the stolen boy. It was an important thing keeping a baby in the house protected from the fairy folk. Iron implements would be hung near the crib or folded into the blankets. Iron will always protect from the fairies. Looking at the subject of changelings with today's eyes and modern understanding of childhood illnesses and genetic disorders can make for very uncomfortable reading. Parents believing their child had been stolen and replaced would treat the baby despicably. Torture with heat was not unheard of. The parents not able to understand why their child was not developing as other children do. It is obvious now that the children in these cases were either ill or sick and the lack of understanding by the community, the ignorance, the lack of compassion and the fear of fairies also was a product of its time. The tales of this are very traumatic and so I will not talk of these here as young people can learn of this as they get older themselves. In this space I want everyone to feel comfortable and so I will focus only on the quirky methods of changeling detection and the lighter side of stories. The way to detect a changeling is to confuse it, make it laugh or make it lose its patience. One way of causing this is to make a huge fuss of cooking a meal or brewing a pot but instead of the usual pots, to use eggshells. At first, the changeling will be curious, then start to become frustrated with the human stupidity. It will speak, giving away its true nature, and sometimes disappear right up the chimney. Or the fairies may come to collect it, returning the true baby. It is as though there is a set of rules to follow, and if the fairies break the rules, they have to return. Another way to detect fairies would be to shout, I bless you, or God bless you. Especially while the fairies were attempting to exchange the human baby for the old fairy who needed a carer. At these words, the kidnap would be abandoned and all would scatter. There were many speaking tricks like this that would foil a fairy into losing an argument and therefore being forced to give the baby back. One interesting story is of a young mother whose baby had been changed for a fairy baby. A knock came at her door and outside stood a beautiful fairy woman with the human baby. She was very distressed. The fairy woman explained 
that other fairies had exchanged the two babies and she wanted her own child back. The babies were exchanged again and both children were saved. On the borders of the countries of Scotland and England, in a truly liminal place, it being an edgeland, a borderland, a fairy place, it was believed that the fairies would take the human babies, sometimes even children or beautiful adults, and take them into the hollow hills where they lived, and had their fairy kingdoms. As well as the tradition that babies would be replaced with elderly fairies needing care, or indeed actual fairy babies, was another belief that the changelings could be male adult elves in a simulation of the human baby. Once suckled by the mother, there would be little to no chance of reclaiming the human child. In this case, the human child would grow up with the fairies, treated beautifully as one of their own. The changeling child, however, would grow up discontented, difficult and tiresome. As with the use of iron against fairy kidnaps, there were many herbs, seeds, flowers and potions that could be used around the house and especially the crib to protect the baby from the fairy thieves. There we have it, my own take and research on the fairy folklore surrounding Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Honestly, I am no scholar of the bard, I just love his work and the way he wove folklore, magic and fairies into his plays. It was all very real to him. It's real to me also. Our folklore crosses times past into today, keeping us connected to the past, present and the future. If, and only if, we keep the knowledge and the tales alive, like the cobweb threads woven by the spiders, a magical connection, a connected knowledge, the web of weird maybe, the spun connections of us all and to us all. Friends, don't forget to like this episode, if you did, please subscribe, and to get notifications of the next video, hit the little bell symbol too. Oh, and please spread the word about the channel, tell your friends, and all lovers of fairy and folk tales, it does help a lot. I will leave this episode with the beautiful protective spell that the fairies chant to lull their queen to sleep. Surely one of the most beautiful lullabies. You spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen, newts and blind worms do no wrong, come not near our fairy queen. Philomel, with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby, lulla lulla lullaby, lulla lulla lullaby. Never harm, nor spell, nor charm, come our lovely lady nigh, so good night, with a lullaby. Weaving spiders, come not here, hence you long-legged spinners, hence, beetles black approach not near, worm nor snail do no offence. Philomel, with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby, lulla lulla lullaby. La 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 lullaby, never harm nor spell nor charm, come our lovely lady nigh, so good night with a lullaby. Until next time dear friends, keep well, brightest of blessings and remember, don't play with the fairy folk or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.